So let us please welcome Joe Natoli. Good afternoon. How is everyone? Good. Good? That's kind of like a, uh, good. Are we good? I want everybody to say yeah on the count of three. Are we good? One, two, three. Much better. All right. So, I say afternoon because, you know, it's almost noon. My topic for you today is disruption. Okay? Is there, I'm assuming everyone knows what I mean by disruption. Think of it as innovation. Okay? Klaus, who was supposed to be here um, and unfortunately couldn't make it, works for an organization who made sort of a case study out of disruption, right? SurveyMonkey challenged the industry they were in by doing something radical, by saying, we're going to democratize this and everyone should have access to it. It should be easy to use, right? Anyone should be able to do this. Radical idea, and a lot of people laughed at it. With a valuation of two point whatever billion dollars later, it wasn't so funny anymore. So. The question that a lot of us struggle with as creative professionals, as designers, as um, even developers, as user interface folks, as UX professionals, is often, especially for those who work in-house, how do we affect that kind of change? How do we get to that kind of level of greatness? Right? How do we transform what's here that we know could be so much better within the constraints and boundaries and sometimes <laughs> iron-fisted rule that we're sort of working under, right? How is that possible? It is possible. So what I'm hopefully going to give you today are five rules that have always rung true throughout my career um, that's worked, that I've watched organizations change behemoth legacy processes and products, app site systems, um, into game changers. Okay, especially when everyone around them was predicting they were on their death knell. So, first and foremost, if the clicker is working, the clicker's not working. Okay, now it's working. <laughs> Here are some of the clients that I have been absolutely honored to serve. Now, I show you this slide not to say, look at all the cool people I've worked for. I show you this slide and these names in particular because these are large organizations, all of whom struggle, <laughs> have struggled, with what I just talked about, simply because of their size in a lot of cases. Okay? The more distributed an organization is, the more layers of management you have, the more decision makers that are involved, the different pressures that are on all those people, the harder it is to respond quickly when the world around you is changing. Okay? All of them, the other thing that all of them have in common is they've found a way to make it happen. Okay? And it happened through a combination of the things I'm going to talk to you about today. First, before I get into the meat of the story, I want to explain to you what I believe user experience is and what it has proven true to be throughout my career. It's unfortunate that the term user is in the title, in a way, because it's about more than just people who use stuff. It is also very much about the business. To me, this is a loop. Value has to go out to people and has to come back. So it works like this. In the center, we have a product, okay? And we have a person who perceives that this might be valuable to them. It might be, might be useful. If they do something, if they open it, if they use it, okay? If they, if they share it, if they do something and they get some value back, a moment where they think, well, okay, that was cool. Or that, wow, that was easier than I thought it was gonna be. Whatever it is, if that happens, and they download it or buy it or share it, value goes out to the business, and then they perceive value. Hey, we're onto something here. This might be worth doing. So they invest in improvements, in making it better. Right? We upgrade it. We have a new release. We have new features, whatever it may be. Both ends of this have to be satisfied for user experience to work, positive user experience. If you fail on either side, you fail. Okay. So consider that sort of a background for what we're going to talk about. The first thing I want to tell you about this idea of disruption is that it's usually painted as some kind of radical revolution, right, that, that rocks everybody's foundations, that makes people's heads spin, as if, you know, some brave soul just stood up and said, we are no longer going to put up with this tyranny, we're going here. And the world just gets up and goes with them, right? 
It doesn't really work that way. No matter who you're talking about, whether it's Steve Jobs or Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos or any of those types of guys, okay, they didn't have this radical revolution. They didn't stand up and get everybody to just go with them. It doesn't work that way. It's not that quick. It's not that simple. <laughs> and it takes a tremendous amount of hard work. Okay? In reality, what happens is that disruption is a heck of a lot quieter than we think it is. It's a lot of hours of hard and sometimes unrecognized effort <laughs> on the part of a great many people all of whom are struggling to deal with the reality of the situation, right? And that can be many things. It may be that they feel like they're unheard. It may be that they don't have the tools or the resources or the budget or the people that they need to pull it off. But it's an uphill climb, all right? And part of that uphill climb is trying to convince people that you work for or with your stakeholders, your clients, your bosses, your managers, whoever it may be, that this stuff is worth it. So tell me if any of these things ring true to you, okay? Have you ever, you know, heard somebody say, or have you ever said <laughs> about people that you're doing work for, they can't get out of their own way, okay? This, this could be so much better. It's a curb this high, and we can't get there because they just will not get out of their own way. Ring true for anyone? How do I get them to listen? Anyone ever said that? Show hands. <laughs> about what I expected, right? How do I get them to listen to me? How do I get them to understand that they're missing an opportunity here? That it matters, that we can do this. How do I convince them that it's worth doing in the first place? Designers, in particular, historically, okay, have a perception problem. And they still do, if you ask me. Even in the enlightened age of 2017, where everyone talks about design and design thinking, and user experience and all this great stuff, it's still misunderstood, okay? I know people with the word UX in their title who are essentially user interface designers. It's not what UX is, all right? But there's a perception problem, and we're gonna talk about that and why that is. Sometimes, disruption, innovation, the change I'm talking about comes from simply drawing a picture, okay? And I wanna tell you a story. What you're looking at here is something that I spend the majority of my time doing with organizations and with teams. It's boxes and arrows. Okay? I don't have any formal system that I follow. There are plenty out there. They're all great. I don't care. I just want to communicate <laughs> with people. So the first thing that we do is we get everybody in the room. On day one, that's all department heads. All right? I want someone from every single department in this organization present at the first meeting the first day. Why? because it's highly likely that they all have competing agendas to some degree, okay? Not everybody wants the same outcome for the same reason. So the first thing I wanna know is what's happening here. So I'll give you an example. I worked with a client a while back who they get grant money to develop uh, products, digital products essentially, healthcare-based organization. What happened is they got all the way to the end where they had to build something, to, to the build, to the launch, what they had built and what they got funded for were two completely different things. Now, that's bad in general, but it's worse for them because they lost that funding money as a result. And we're not talking about a few dollars here. So they had a how the heck did this happen moment. So the first thing that we did is we spent three days talking to each department and I said, walk me through what you do from the time you walk in this office, the time a project starts, to the time it ends, all right? And we had big wall-sized whiteboards, and we did this. The black stuff is, here's how the process goes. The orange marks are, as we're doing it, I'm saying, are there any problems that crop up here? And they say, yeah, well, we do this, and then we have to wait three days because we don't hear back from so-and-so, this and that, right? So you call it out like this. We want to know where the issues are. Long story short, over a period of three days, what we find out is that each of these departments is doing somewhere around 20 to 30 percent of the other department's work. And nobody knows this is happening. There's duplication. There are things that are incorrect because certain teams don't have the information they need and they're guessing. <laughs> they're sharing these checklists that are supposed to keep everybody honest, but nobody's filling them out. 
right? So when we showed them this after three days, they were shocked. They were shocked. To a man, they said, we had no idea this was going on. Point being this, I was brought in there because what they believed is that they had a redesign problem. They had a user experience problem. They had a defect in the way that they were producing the artifact. The real issue lied in how they were working together. Now, as designers, I would be willing to bet that a lot of you see that kind of thing, but feel like maybe it's not your place to say anything about it. Accurate for anybody? OK? You can affect the outcome simply by changing part of the conversation. When you start asking about how people do things and why they do them, you have an indoor to talk about them, to talk to them about what is happening and why. All right? So the first rule I want to give you is that the potential for disruption is highest when pain is greatest. <laughs> All right? When they're really hurting in some way, that's when your opportunity is the highest to say, all right, this needs to change. It is very difficult to convince an organization to do something that doesn't benefit them in some way if they're not feeling the pain of not doing it, right? If they're not losing money or, or losing market share or losing people or wh whatever the case may be. Until there's pain, nothing changes. I'll give you another story. There's a, a large organization um, that I worked with who had built system upon system upon system, sort of jerry-rigged all this stuff on top of each other to produce print-on-demand brochures. So again, the assumption is that our design process is broken. What I come to find out is that they're trying to implement, it was Adobe Lifecycle, actually, um, which we thought was a perfect fit for them. It streamlined all their design effort, all their design work, and got everybody rowing in the same direction. But we kept meeting resistance. Right? And I couldn't figure out why. So one day, we're, we're down in the plant where all these, these printers, machines are, and all this stuff. And one of the guys pulls me aside and says, you need to understand something. My team, the IT team, has a great deal of time and money invested in this. These are our jobs. We've built these custom systems ourselves. If you try to kill this, if you try to introduce anything into this organization, I will kill this project. You have my word on that. And he's like poking me in the chest. <laughs> so I thought, wow, OK. He's unemployed now. Okay? And I say that not to be snark snarky. I say that because until there's a situation like that that's that intense, where the company is really hurting and everybody is really uncomfortable, quite often it doesn't happen. Until some of this dysfunction starts to surface, it's very hard to get anywhere. All right. That's how you roll the rock up the hill, and that's how you keep it there, by finding out what their pain is. What are they worried about? What are they afraid of? What's hurting them? The next thing is when you are speaking to your boss or your client, right, or marketing or IT or whoever is involved, you have to be speaking the language of business, not design. Okay? You can talk about good design all day long. We all know that. We get it. Right? I, could, I could have a conversation with any of you about the good principles behind good user experience because they're the same as the principles behind good design. We all get it. That's great. We know why it's important. They don't care about that. Okay? They don't care. It's like a foreign language. One of the greatest things that ever happened to me was also one of my most embarrassing moments. I was young, I had just started my own firm. We had, I think, three employees, and I was sort of overly self-confident, as a lot of young people are likely to do. <laughs> and I got invited by somebody who, at least on the East Coast, was sort of like a local design legend who was teaching a course at University of Baltimore. He said, I'd like you to come talk to my class. OK, cool. So we get up there, and I, and I do my, my spiel, and we're doing a Q&A afterwards, and he says, Tell these, tell these guys about something that didn't go well for you, something that went wrong, right? A bad situation, uncomfortable situation. I thought, okay. And of course, I had one. So I tell this story about how, you know, I, I was working with this client, and I couldn't move them out of their own way. You know, I couldn't get them to realize that 
the design of this stuff was so bad and they needed to go here and people were ignoring them because, and I'm rallying off all this very self-righteous bullshit. And I'm feeling really good about it. So I stop and he looks at me, this person who I look up to on this, this pedestal, right, looks at me and says, what did you do wrong there? And you have this moment, like, well, I, I, what do you mean? I, I, I told them what they needed to, and, and I'm thinking about it, right? So now I'm asking myself the question, what did I do wrong there? What I did wrong is I didn't talk to them about how any of this was going to help their organization, right? Bottom line, what's the outcome going to be? Are we going to get more people? Are we going to get more sales? Are we going to get a, a bigger market share? Are we going to get more people paying attention to us? Online on a daily basis, what is it? I didn't talk about any of that. Instead, I spent my entire time with them trying to educate them about good design because they were ignorant. Wrong conversation. Okay, if you're talking about fonts and colors and principles, you're having the wrong conversation. You are never going to move anybody off that perch that they're on believing that what you do isn't important to them until you change the conversation and show them how that work benefits them directly. And I don't just mean the business. I mean the individual sitting there. Remember I told you a few minutes ago, I like to have all these different people in the room on day one. The reason is I want to know what they need. I want to know what they want. I want to know where their pain is because it is not all the same. So you're not just ever appealing to the business as a whole. You are appealing to every stakeholder in that room, their personal pain, their personal desired outcome. You have to know what those things are. Because if you can speak to the work that you're doing and tell them and explain how it alleviates that problem, now you're having a productive conversation. Now they're going to listen to you. Okay? Third thing. Without adoption, disruption is impossible. This is especially relevant to any of us who have ever done visual design of any kind. If people don't use what's in front of them, okay, that opportunity to really become a game changer doesn't ever materialize. And I want to take a moment to pick on something in particular, and that is sort of two trends that I still see a lot of. Number one is flat design. Everyone familiar with that term? How many? Show of hands. Okay. Everybody familiar with the concept of minimal UI or Chromeless user interfaces? Anybody? All right. What that means, essentially, is that you're stripping away as much control as possible, as much navigation, as much um, links, buttons, whatever, wayfinding, to just focus on what's going on right now. Both of these trends are situations where people are, designers in particular, are sort of aping the look, the feel, the style, and it doesn't fit the context in which people are using <laughs> the app, okay? You strip away all this stuff and then no one knows how to find anything. Flat design in particular, where everything on a screen looks exactly alike and you can't tell the difference between a button and a headline that has a, a banner, you know, a color banner behind it, it fails, okay? When you see people use these things in a usability test, it fails. So the why behind what you're doing, the context behind what you're doing, the appropriateness of what you're doing should drive what you're creating visually. If it doesn't, people don't use things. We all look at it and go, wow, that looks awesome. I saw this, something like this on Dribbble. That's awesome. We should do you know, things like that. Now, how many of your clients or, or bosses do that to you. I saw this. We should make it like this. How many? <laughs> right? I've been there, okay? I've been there. The only way, again, that you move them off that is to show them why a different approach is better for them. Not because it's better design, not because it's, you know, better principles, because of what it does, because this will get people to actually use this thing, right? And we could possibly get some kind of results, some kind of market share. The next is another piece of advice that somebody gave me that I never forgot. It was a consultant. I was working for, um, when I sold my company, I sold it to an IT firm. And I hung out there for a couple years to try and help them establish a UX practice, which served to make me realize why I didn't want to work for any other people anymore. 
But they had a consultant come in. They were very big on management consultants, okay? So every other week, there'd be a different person in there telling them to do things that they were never going to do. And this guy said something that stuck with me. And I, I went, remember, I went in my office and I wrote it down on the whiteboard in my office. He said, silence equals agreement, which means if you are sitting in a meeting, if you're having a discussion, and you are hearing something that you do not agree with, that you don't think is possible, that you don't think is feasible, that you don't think is wise, you have to speak up and say something about it. Because if you do not, you're not only agreeing that it's the right thing to do, in many cases you are agreeing to do it. <laughs> so you know what happens when it fails? There's always more than one finger pointed, right? Maybe four, but at least one of them is gonna be pointed at you. And they're gonna say, why didn't you say anything? <laughs> okay? There are lots of reasons that happens. I talked to somebody yesterday who told me, you know, we've, we've reached this moment where now some of us as designers, we're actually being invited into the business meetings, strategy meetings. And it's awesome, but we feel like we don't want to screw it up, right? We don't want to get disinvited if we say something that pisses somebody off. I get that. But there's a way to do that that's diplomatic, that's respectful, and that says to those people, look, I just want to make sure I understand what you want the outcome to be here so that when I walk out of here, you know, we, we do our work accordingly. If you don't speak up, the other thing that, that's happening is, is that you're robbing everyone in the room of your talent, of your ability, right? Of, of what's between your ears, of what you're best at. You have something to contribute. You wouldn't be employed if you didn't have something to contribute, okay? You wouldn't be doing this work, you wouldn't be studying this work. You have something to contribute. Do not ever forget that. The one thing that I've always sort of used as a guideline for myself in any conversation I have is that I don't care about being right, okay? I care about getting to the truth. I care about getting to fact. How are we gonna do this? Why are we doing it? How are we gonna get it done? I don't care about being right. I don't care about being the smartest person in the room. It's important to speak up, okay? I'll give you a quick story and then we'll move on. I'm with a, a client in, in a room full of, there's 12 developers, there's four database people, and then there's a, a team overseas in India on the phone um, of about 12 or 13 people. There is a religious debate going on about why this massive volume of data in one of their, their internal facing systems loads so slowly, okay? To the tune of like you're waiting 60 seconds at least, in best case, for anything to show up on the screen. So there's like a war breaking out. And usually what I do when this happens is I step back, I watch it, and I sort of wait for an opportunity to, to okay, how do I calm everybody down, right? <laughs> it's going and going and going and going and going. And finally it starts to die down by itself. And in the silence, one guy who's been sitting in the back saying nothing the entire time raises his hand, everybody looks at him, and he goes, why do we need to surface all that data in the first place? Does anybody care about it? Pin drop. Okay? Two dozen people in the room are like, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> right? But he was right. And it forced everybody to rethink what the hell they would argue about in the first place. You're asking the wrong question. Okay? Silence equals agreement. If he had shut his mouth, they would have never got there. So what they did is they chopped off like 80% of what was there because they did. They went back and looked at analytics and saw that no one was using it. Okay, if you don't say anything, the potential for that change to occur never happens. Okay, believe in what you have to offer. Next thing, this is a big one. Okay, disruption, innovation, call it whatever you want, is not fearless. Think of people that you admire. Have you ever thought of them as being fearless? Show of hands. Right? They're not afraid to take on new challenges, do new things. There's no such thing. Okay? Nobody's fearless. The most accomplished people in the world have probably said at one point or another 
that there were plenty of times where they doubted everything that they were doing, okay? I've been, I've been lucky to have a long career, you know, for 26 years. There are plenty of times when I doubt what I'm doing. There are plenty of times where I feel like, oh my God, what, am I, what have I just dipped my toe into? Okay? It happens. It's part of life. And the key isn't waiting until you're at this perfect state where you're not feeling any fear to act. The key is feeling the fear and doing it anyway. Okay? So that is the piece of advice I have for you. Oops, went too fast. See what happens? Again, if, if I keep saying, you know, this is one of the mo most important lessons I've learned, um, but this is a big one. Okay, I talk to a lot of people daily. I get a lot of students, and particularly that email me, young designers that email me. I get like upwards of 100 plus emails a day. And they're all variations of the same question. I really want to do this. I'm convinced I can do it because A, B, C, D, E, and F. But I'm just, I don't, you know, I'm, I don't think I can, I, I'm, I'm worried that I won't be able to pull it off once I go. Like, what's your advice? My advice is you just have to do it. There is no other way to know. All right? If you're in an organization that is struggling with something and you feel like you have the answer, you have to speak up. You have to talk to people. You have to make it a point to go to people's offices and say, hey, can I talk to you for five minutes? Whatever it is, you got to push through that and do it anyway. <laughs> okay? That's how things happen. I have three quick things I want to tell you about, one of which um, is essentially a gift to all of you for showing up, for being here today. Um, I know this was last minute. I wasn't planned to talk today, but I'm very happy that you all came out. So three quick things, and then I'm going to open it up to questions. The first thing is I run a private Facebook group called Give Good UX Company of Friends. There are 3,000 members. This is a place where people can ask questions, things they're struggling with. I'm dealing with this at work. I'm dealing with this with a client. I'm dealing with this with a project. What do I do? It's been amazing because people come out of the woodwork to offer advice, share their stories, and help each other. It's a fantastic thing. It's why I did it, and I'm very gratified um, that it's become what it is. So if you are so inclined, check it out. The second thing is um, I run a couple courses on Udemy, as, as Adam mentioned. I'd like to give you one of them for free. The class is called User Experience Design Fundamentals. It is, it is the core bottom line of everything I have ever done in my career. <laughs> okay, and it's born out of everything that I know. You can go there and check it out, okay, but in order to sign up, just follow this link. If you are, you know, if you'd like to enroll in the class, it's usually $99. It's absolutely free to all of you if you want it. Go to that link, fill out your name and your email, and you'll get a link in your email inbox with a code that takes you to free registration. The last thing is I'm working on an eight-week boot camp. Um, it's going to be a unique experience, 20 students, very small class size, so it's going to be very direct. We're going to do some one-on-one -on -one piece, pieces. It is remote, but um, we're going to have sort of an early bird notification sign up for people who are interested. So if you're interested in that and you go get the free course, there's a little question that says, are you interested in the boot camp? Just say yes or no. And if you are, we'll send you more information. That is it for me. I now invite your questions. Thank you. Anybody? Conservative place? So marketing sends you down a certain direction and then they change their minds later? Yeah, yeah. Okay, after they see what you have? Yeah. yeah. So what's the question? How do I deal with that? How do I change it? Well, how, how, do, how, do, how do I avoid, how do we as a team avoid being known as the complainers when we speak 
being known as the complainers, <laughs> right? So you guys are the complainers. You're a pain in the ass to deal with. Right, right. All right, so number one, they don't understand why you're involved in the first place, <laughs> right? So why, is, why are design the complainers? The key there and the key with any type of friction inside an organization, and this is not always easy, okay? So what I'm going to give you sounds a lot simpler than it really is. You have to find out how the work that you do solves a pain that they have, all right? I'll go back to what I said earlier. There is pain somewhere. There is frustration somewhere. It is also possibly likely that they are as frustrated with the churn as you are. So it could be the case that, look, if, if you just involved us further and we had collaboration, some of this might go away. But the key is you've got to find out what they care about, what's really hurting them, what is causing pain for each one of those people where they are in their car coming to work going, oh, my God, why do I have to deal with this today? Find out what it is and connect the work you do to it and have conversations and say, look, we can alleviate this. Here's what I think is happening. Here's how I think we could, we could solve it. It's got to be personal for them. Okay? What else? I got, I got a mic. Oh, okay, you got a mic? Cool. So I, I was wondering if you have any advice. So a typical problem for designers is that uh, in order to show uh, a business person how design would affect them. We or, can't hear this at all. I can't hear this at all. In order for, ooh, all righty. Uh, it sounded very loud in my head, but yeah. okay. Um, so I was wondering if you had any advice for designers, because one of the big problems for us, in order to convince business owners or, or business stakeholders how design would affect them, and especially how bad design would affect them, is that it's based on data that we're not always privy to. Why? We don't have access to it. We don't always have access to it, I would say. Okay, okay. So, so performance data. So sometimes there is performance data where you can say to them, look, this is why this is hurting us. Right. Right, the current design, here's what's happening. People are dropping off here and things like that. Right. So you're saying in the absence of that data, what do you, I do? You would have to convince them to go looking for it, right? And you could maybe help them find the data, but they would be, have to be willing to share it with you. Right, here's what I would say to you. Um, if this is possible, Okay, it's not always possible. One thing I said to the group yesterday, and I say this a lot, is get in the habit of, in a nice way, not asking for permission. <laughs> Ask for forgiveness instead. In other words, find a way to get that information. Don't ask, someone other than the gatekeepers usually has it. You know what I mean? It could be sales, it could be uh, marketing, it could be people in the help desk. And even then, okay, if you have help desk people who are answering the phones, no one ever talks to them <laughs> in projects. Same thing happens with sales for some reason, which blows my mind. Find out, however you can, what people are complaining about, okay? And then say, here's what I learned. Here's what we're hearing. I think that this could solve that. In other words, instead of asking them for it, see if you can find a way to get it some other way. Okay, real quick, and then we'll get to A follow-up, or maybe, a, I guess, tag on a recommendation to that. So I think that someone else in, in some other seminar was using the expression, yes, if. And something that we've found to yeah. be very useful is if you don't have the data or if you don't actually want to say it to somebody that you see the thing that you're asking for is really performing really poorly, that might be a sensitive issue. What you can do is, yes, we can absolutely do what you're asking for if you let us test it. Of course. And we will test it, and if it performs well, great. If yeah. we can test something as an A-B test against what you're telling us Absolutely. to do, then we can prove if it's a better way. It's a great method. It's a great method. It will not work in every organization, but it's a great method. What else? Who else? No? It's hard to see if we got hands or not. No burning questions? This young man over here. Give that man the mic so we can all hear you. Hi. Um, you were talking about having the right conversations. And, um, you know, often when we're starting, we, we, we tend to, like you said, self-righteous. And, you know, we use this font or use this color. And, you know, people are like, oh, yeah, yeah, whatever. Sure. Uh, so then you switch to, to the right conversation. But then let's switch it around. You get people who are not designers 
uh, in the groups start talking to you about design and stuff, and they don't know what they're talking about. Right, because so they know how to do your job. Right. So, so we'll ha what's the tip to get them to like, hey, hey, guys, we know we're having the wrong conversation here. So well, again, it, it's all these all these questions are sort of dovetailing together, right? For me, that's a couple things. It's you find a polite way to say, based on what? Okay. In other words, somebody says, well, it should be like this. It should look like this. It should act like this, right? I mean, you guys have all dealt with that. So it's either, okay, well, and you frame it in a way to say, okay, that's interesting. What, why is it that you believe it, it needs to be that way? And that's all. And you let them explain. And they may, and they may say something like, well, you know, we saw so-and-so is doing this, and I, I just think this is awesome, and, and we have to do that. And you say, well, do we have any evidence that our users, our customers, whoever, um, wants that kind of thing, needs that kind of thing, you know, are they complaining about not having this or this feature or this, that's not, it's not designed like, you know, whatever. Are we hearing any of that? Now, some people will follow down the path with you and some people will get pissed off and stop talking to you. <laughs> Either way, it's always worth asking, okay? Because for as long as I've been doing this, there's an equal amount of people who are just obsessed with being right, okay, about everything. And then there are a large number of other people who honestly don't realize that they're directing to the degree that they are. What's happening is they're acting out of fear, okay, this need to control everything. And it's usually behind there's going to be punishment if this doesn't work in some way. A lot of times that's what's motiv motivating that. And they don't realize the degree to which they're not letting people do their jobs, honestly. So in those situations, simply saying, okay, well, what data do we have? What do we know? Or you say, what outcome does that achieve for us if it looks like this? What do we think is going to happen as a result? And that's it. You let it hang there. <laughs> really, I mean, outside of that, there isn't a whole lot you can do if the person just sort of digs in their heels and refuses to do anything. Okay? There are certain battles you can't win. And you also need to learn to recognize those as well and stop fighting. Make the thing the best it can be outside of those conventions. And if you feel like the stakes are high and if you feel like your neck is on the chopping block, then design it the way you think it should be designed anyway <laughs> and present it and say, here's why we did this. We heard you. We heard it needed to be this. But just consider A, B, C, D, E. I've done that plenty of times too. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. One more? Yeah, I got, got one question. Oh, we um, got time. This is more esoteric, I guess. It's, it's, it's your thoughts on... Not here. Oh. Keep it close. Close, okay. What are your thoughts on design and flatness and all of that? It's, it's so forced. It, I like to look at it as... as you know, I, I think some of that is going to futuristically stick around, but you know, it's going to change. What's the next thing? Sure. Who the hell knows? But sure. but I mean, it's such a bandwagon that you're kind of forced onto. And then with the Google Material Rules and all this stuff, it's like, talk to us about that designer shit for a minute. Well, Sorry. I, 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 again, it's a matter of it's a matter of appropriateness. I talked yesterday about the difference between design and decoration, okay? There are lots of people who create beautiful visual artifacts, beautiful user interfaces, beautiful print pieces, beautiful all sorts of stuff, but it doesn't help anybody do anything. It doesn't help anybody understand anything. It doesn't get anyone closer to whatever it is that, that the goal is. That's decoration, okay? There's nothing inherently wrong with that. But if you're a designer and your, your goal is, particularly with user interfaces, to allow people to do something, even if it's playing a game, right, and getting more enjoyment out of that, it's all about context. It's all about how are they going to interpret this? Is it going to mean something to them? Are they going to know what to do with it? Are there enough visual cues to say, yes, you do this? Because people will not spend a lot of time trying to figure it out. So there's nothing inherently wrong with flat design. There's nothing inherently wrong with Google's material design or all these other sort of schools of thought. But 
you have to recognize that just because something is a trend doesn't mean it's appropriate for every situation. Appropriateness, context, relevance. Is anyone going to get this? Whether people get it or don't get it? Well, I mean, that's, that's the key, but we also have these different executions of that language. Right. And so, like, like I just wrote a brand standard and I said, we are the icon. You can express them in one of three ways. Right, so you have guidelines. You say, here are the icons, you use these. Yeah. But, so what's the issue? There's deviation from that? Or, I'm not sure what you're asking me. <laughs> So what do you use, in other words? There's so many options. How do you know what to use? Okay. Right. Right, right, right. So, and there are, the way you combat that is there, there are rules for that. As a matter of fact, it's funny you mentioned icons. Um, I just wrote a blog post about proper icon use, along with a cheat sheet that says, all right, is it this? Yes or no? Is it this? Yes or no? Is it this? Yes or no? All right, then maybe you use this, this icon, or maybe you use this icon with a label, or maybe you use no icon and a label. What has to be introduced is a thought process, okay, that forces people to think about why they, they think that icon is right, okay? These guys are saying it should be a floppy disk icon, because that makes sense to them. They don't know how to get out of their own heads. They don't know how to sort of step back and be objective about that. But if they have a process for thinking about it, and if you introduce a concrete way to say, here's why that doesn't work, and teach them to sort of self-evaluate, that changes. Okay? I do a lot of this with development teams in particular, because a lot of them are forced to be UI designers, whether they want to be or not. Some of them you know, think they're great at it, and some don't really want to do it in the first place. But you need some rules, you need some tools and methods, and it has to be done in a way where you're not saying, I'm right and you're wrong. You won't convince anybody of anything. Yeah, you, they have to have a tool um, that allows them to think through that process. And like I said, okay, seven times out of 10, you're gonna find that if they have the right tools in front of them to think about this stuff in the right way, they're more likely to do the right thing. It doesn't always work, but it does sometimes. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, if, uh, you know, if you want to corner me <laughs> and, and you have other things you, that are on your mind, I'm, I'm happy to talk to you. Thanks for your time and attention. I appreciate it.